You're listening to the Tom Green Podcast. This is Tom. I'm still at home, isolating, self-isolating, sheltering in place, quarantining, whatever you want to call it, during the pandemic of uh, COVID-19 coronavirus outbreak. Uh, this is completely surreal and strange, and I got to tell you, you guys and and uh, folks, all you men and women around the world, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, people of all ages, thank you for being here for me. I'm trying to uh, create a little distraction for myself and hopefully for you uh, during this time when we're all stuck in our homes. I am so excited about today's show. I can't even begin to really explain exactly how excited I am. It's hard for me to actually explain it, but I'm going to try to explain it right now. I grew up uh, loving hip-hop music, rap music. I started a little rap group when I was a teenager. We were called Organized Rhyme, and we got a record deal when I was uh, about 18 years old. A couple years before that, we went down to New York City. We recorded a demo in the summer. It was August. We went down there for five weeks, and we lived with a, a producer down there named Boogie, Boogie Bradley. And we made some uh, some music, and we, we thought we were just uh, so cool. You know, we had jackets made. They said organized rhyme on the back, and on the front it said police, because we were the organized rhyme unit of the police department. That's what, that's what we were thinking. And we walked around our city, Ottawa, Canada, with our matching jackets. We had backup dancers. Uh, it was a pretty elaborate thing. We did we did wild and crazy shows. Uh, we would perform on stage at at bars and nightclubs around Ottawa. And eventually, we got this record deal. I had a radio show called the Midnight Caller Radio Show. But before that, it was the Rap Show. The ra- the way I got the Midnight Caller Radio Show was I the radio station let me do a rap show, a, a hip hop show because I was uh, essentially uh, in a rap group, and they thought that was pretty cool. But one of my favorite, favorite rappers and rap groups of all time was MC Search and Third Base. Unbelievable that I get to talk to Search today. You know, I grew up being a huge fan. Uh, the Gas Face was the first time I, I heard Third Base. Uh, the Gas Face, watch that video. Watch the video for Product of the Environment or watch the video for Pop Goes the Weasel. These were songs that were a big part of my life growing up. And uh, recently, I uh, was following MC Search on Instagram, as we would all do. We follow our, our, our heroes and our idols and like to check in and see how the people we, we look up to are doing. And I liked a few pics, and then I saw Search liked a couple of my picks, and all of a sudden we're com- communicating. I'm communicating with the MC, the MC search. And uh, over the last uh, few weeks, we've actually had a few chats on the phone, touched base. Uh, you know, search uh, was nice enough to uh, tell me that his favorite bit from the Tom Green show was the Marshmallow Factory bit. Uh, if you know that one, uh, well, then then you know that was kind of a silly piece of video, and we talk a little bit about that. But really what we spend most of our time talking about, something that I'm really, really interested is in, is the early days of hip-hop music in New York City, where Third Base is from, from New York. They were there during the beginning when hip-hop, the, this huge new genre of music began. And not only did they witness it, they were part of shaping it. And uh, I'm really, really thrilled to be able to talk to Search today about that third base. They're known for their sense of humor as well as for their dope rhymes. And um, listen, Search, Search doesn't uh, leave any uh, any of that on the table here. He's definitely uh, a very entertaining cat. Uh, lots to, to listen to here, including some of his many uh, hip hop beefs and, and the battles that he's had with various rappers who you may have heard of over the years. So we'll get into a little bit of that, but for the most part, we're going to cover early days of hip hop and everything else that Search has been up to these days. So we're, we're going to have a good conversation. I'm excited for you to hear it. So now I will introduce MC Search much the way he was introduced to the world in the song and video for The Gas Face. Everybody, MC Search. 
What up, Search? Hey, what up, man? What up, man? It's working. It's working. Good, good to talk to you. Thanks for calling the podcast today. How you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm, uh, I'm good, as, as, as good as good can be, given the situation, but uh, I'm trying to have some fun here with the podcast and try to keep it light and uh, uh, trying to create a healthy distraction for, uh, for my listeners. Uh, how's, how's everything up in, uh, you're in Florida, right? Yeah, now you're saying, you know, with everything that's going on, what is, what is going on exactly? Um, the, uh, the, the, the pandemic? Did you did you hear about the you heard about the the pandemic, didn't you? Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm a rap artist, so I don't really know what's up what's going on in the world. Oh. So oh. you're gonna have to like speak English to me. Oh man. I I, like, what, what's, I, I have no <laughs> idea what the fuck you're talking about, B. Are you serious, Search? Oh man, I didn't yeah, it, like Oh yeah. I, I know what a pan is. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Okay, I didn't. Uh, you gotta be careful, man. There's a pandemic going on, so you don't, you can't go outside. Have you been going outside? Yo, man, I stay outside. B, I'm an MC. I oh. stay outside. What oh. are you talking about? Like, I, I the, 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 man, the, I really wanted this joke to go someplace, but I just <laughs> realized I'm not a comic at all. I like it. I, re- man. I was really trying to like go somewhere with the joke. I like. And I it like just it. Died on the vine. No, right no, there. no way, Kinda man. Like my rap career. No way. Don't so, apologize at all. I jumped anyway. right into it. I was. I thought it was. I. Th- I, I, I was feeling. No, it, it would have been great. I appreciate it. It was definitely. It was definitely. <laughs> Uh, it was a moment. We tried. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. I mean, that would have been that would have been amazing. You're, you're the last person on earth that doesn't know about <laughs> the coronavirus. <laughs> That's an actually great idea for like we should actually try to do that as a sitcom. You and I. Yeah, I mean, like would, pan what? That would be amazing. I uh, first of like, all, I just want to yeah. say. Uh, you know, it's been great getting to know you over the last, uh, you know, couple of months. Uh, you know, I've been following you on Instagram, of course, but personally, I've been, you know, a huge fan of of Third Base since I was uh, in my little rap group when I was a kid, and it's uh, it's an honor just to get to know you, man. So it's pretty cool. Well, that's pretty cool about how Instagram works, right? One second you're watching someone, then I like a few things, and you liked a few things, and I reached out, and now we're talking about the marshmallow bit that you bring up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, so first of all, I had no idea you followed me at all on Instagram. That was, that's A, like as great as social media is, it's only obvious until it becomes obvious. You yeah. know, like it, it really is one of those things where, you know, unless somebody tells you somebody else is following you. Like I had that with John Cryer. Like I found out John Cryer is a huge like fan of mine as well. Yeah. I'm like a huge like old school hip hop head. And I didn't know that he was a fan of mine until a friend of mine who's not even in the industry at all. He's like on the sales side of radio kind of became cool with him. And it became like he was cool with me. And then John Cryer was like, wait a minute. Carl, you know, search like so. It would just became crazy, and then and then obviously, John and I started communicating via uh, social media. But I mean, I've been a fan of yours like since the very very early days of your career, yeah. and I've and I've told you this, and I've told many people. You're not the only one I've told. I mean that skit about the marshmallows when you go to the marshmallow factory on the tom green show uh-huh, uh-huh. when you had your show on mtv uh-huh. yo to me that is one of the funniest skits i've ever like it, it burned in my memory like i hadn't <laughs> seen it in decades and i still remember it's, i think it's burned. you walking around that marshmallow factory with <laughs> with the marshmallow hat <laughs> I think it might be burned in in my memory, but for a completely different reason. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, and you and you're giving fellatio. To the yeah, that's the reason. The guy telling you that you have to use the marshmallow for what it is. You know, you know when the marsh when the marshmallow comes out of the marshmallow factory tube, it comes out in sort of a very phallic looking shape, and of course, one thing led to another in front of the factory tour, and uh, the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was incredible, and like it was, and when he said you have to use it for what it's intended, like <laughs> that's a double on 
entendre. That's so funny because <laughs> what are you not supposed to eat marshmallow? Like what what is the what is the intention of yeah. marshmallow? Yeah, yeah. It's just, to put it in your mouth. Yeah, just just you not know, that way. The only, yeah. <laughs> I guess not that right. You know, I guess you're not supposed to suck on marshmallow. <laughs> I guess not. Yeah. But if you would have played Akinelli, put it in your mouth as the backup music. Yeah. Yo, yeah. I might have died. Like the blood and the air, the oxygen would have like definitely stopped flowing to my head <laughs> from me laughing so hard. I would have dropped dead right then and there. That first of all, that show is like one of those many shows that was not only before its time, but is in desperate need of a reboot because it was just so funny. You know, I. To me, your show is up there with like Ernie Kovacs, Monty Python. It's like shows that are just so legitimately wow. before its time. Well, those are my favorites. Um, you driving the scooter in the in the supermarket is akin to, you know, Ali, you know, um, Sasha Baron Cohen knocking everything over. Yo, that's the shit to me that like makes you just leaps and bounds above everybody else and and why your shows are in so in desperate need of a reboot bro yeah, like man. real talk like and that's real talk and like my son who you and i have talked about a million times my son is in la and you know he had two people he wanted to meet in la and i had no relationship to year one and adam f goldberg was the other and by you know by happenstance you know my son got to connect with both of y'all so it's it's a blessing all the way around man it's it's so cool to hear hear all this because you know it's the thing the thing is when my show first went on mtv i was you know i'd never been even around you know famous people before let alone people that i grew up idolizing like yourself so i was so nervous around around about people, I, I wish I could go back and have have reached out to you right away and invited you on the show, and we could have done some crazy shit together when I was on when I was on MTV. But you know, wait, we'll we'll do it. We'll do it. We're doing it now, man. We're doing it now. Um, I want to um, I want to like uh, ask you some stuff about the 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 origination of hip hop in your life because. You know, on the show, normally I've been talking a lot about the pandemic, but I just think I want to kind of switch gears today and talk a little bit about hip hop because when else does my my audience get an opportunity to hear from the legendary MC Search from Third Base? When was the first time you you heard rap music, you personally? Yeah, it's interesting how you just correlated hip hop and the pandemic virus at the same <laughs> lyrical uh, level. By the way, uh, so I do appreciate your skills on that level. Um, hip hop and the coronavirus deserve to be on the same plane Absolutely. as the largest genres in the world today. Absolutely. Uh, so thank you for that. No problem. Um, you know, I mean, for me, you know, I, what what I what I'm blown away by uh, today. Uh, is when I tell young people, hey, I used to listen to hip-hop when hip-hop wasn't even a business, when it wasn't on the radio, when it wasn't even a pressed form of music, when there was no music business, you know, there was no rap business. You know, um, you know, my first hearing of hip hop were fourth and fifth generation cassette tapes of crews in the five boroughs that my friend, you know, Thomas and my friend Gregory, who later became, you know, the God Shaw born and understanding and the God mathematics and became five percenters were listening to these, you know, cassette tapes of cassette tapes and, you know, going to the high school music and art and hearing kids banging on desks that became, you know, MCs and, and stars in their own right, like, you know, Dana Dane and Jay Cool uh, from the first three MCs and Ricky D and, you know, as well as, you know, seeing Jennifer and Aniston on stage and Chastity Bono and, you know, uh, Mark Pitts, who went on to manage Changing Faces and, and Biggie. And, you know, so, you know, we were this very talented group of New York kids who 
kind of just saw and ran the streets from, you know, all different levels, you know, like, you know, even now, like one of my favorite shows of my wife is RuPaul's Drag Race. Yeah. Um, because I remember voguing, not being called voguing, like, you know, the, the kids that were dancers in my high school who were gay would do these posing games based on the ballrooms in New York City. And they were, and they basically played. I don't know if you remember this this game, red light, green light, one, two, three. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, when we were kids, so the gay kids in my neighborhood would play red light, green light. But when they get caught, they had to be in a fly pose. And if they weren't in a fly pose, then they got sent back. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that's how you know my lunchroom was like. On one side, you know, these great MCs, you know, banging on tables and beatboxing and rhyming, and on the other side was, you know, these guys doing red light, green light, one, two, three, and and you know, so it was this amazing, you know, epicenter of culture on all levels. Like, you know, I was. Chilling with Michelle, Michelle Visage before she was in her group. I knew Betty from Seduction before she was in her group. So it was, it was whether it was like hip hop music, if it was disco, if it was dance, if it was club music, it was like, it was all there before it ever became press, digitized, broadcast, you know, satellited. I want to use some hip-hop vernacular right there. Satellited. <laughs> you know, motherfuckers getting that shit satellited. You know, before there was the internet, before there was anything, you know. Um, and those were, you know, for me, you know, what was so amazing about you know, this culture is that, you know, I got to see it from, it's really from its, you know, from it being incubated in New York to it growing and developing and becoming this, you know, the largest music genre in the world. How did it go from being a fan of the culture and loving the music to grabbing the mic and getting up and rapping on stage? Do you remember the first time you did that? What was that feeling like? I mean, for me, it was, it was, you know, first of all, to even think about a white MC being able to be white and MC and, and have a career was ridiculous. Yeah, you were the... It wasn't going to happen. You, you were the, the gr groundbreaking uh, group that came out, the white rap group that came out, and you were, you were doing it, you know, straight up hip hop, too. It wasn't rock and roll hip hop. It was straight up hip hop. That was kind of something that was new, even compared to the Beastie Boys, which, you know, are dope. And I love the Beastie Boys, but they were more punk rock. You guys were straight up B-boy hip hop style. Was that, did that just blow people away when they first saw that? I think, you know, I don't know if it, it's difficult to, Again, it's one of these things where it's really hard for people to understand now when you have so many MCs who do things and make music so well. Even, you know, you have this big thing with this kid, NF, out of Detroit, because Detroiters don't want another Eminem out of Detroit, right? And this kid, NF, is just killing shit on the underground, and he's a white MC out of Detroit. And it's like, once again, it's like, oh, there can only be one white MC out of Detroit, right? It's like, it's fucking crazy. It's like, if you're dope, you're dope. It doesn't matter where you're from. But when I was coming up, first of all, there were no white people rhyming, period. The first white boy I ever saw was a kid named Blake Latham, a.k.a. Keo, uh, Kiwe K, a graffiti artist who later be, you know, his name was Vanilla B., <laughs> uh, for Vanilla Blake. Yeah. Um, and he was the first white rapper I ever saw. Yeah. Um, there's a famous uh, folklore in the streets that supposedly Blake ran up on Big Daddy Kane in uh, downtown Brooklyn. Yeah. And rhymed in front of him. And he, supposedly Blake was the first person to say, rap prime minister. Yeah. And Kane 
supposedly heard that and then use that in some way, shape, or form in a rhyme or whatever. But, you know, there's all this famous folklore about Vanilla B, right? Blake and Lord Scotch. And, you know, he was in a, a group with my former partner, the Swervin Generals. And, you know, so he was like, he was the only one you ever saw in a cipher rhyming. Like, if I ever thought about, you know, rhyming in a cipher, my initial thought was somebody's going to beat my ass uh -huh. for, like, even thinking about being in a, you know, a circle of other MCs who are of color. Yeah. Like, I don't have any rightful place in that. Um, and then later on and later on, like, just as I started to become more comfortable with the rhymes that I was writing and the rhymes that I was reciting in my house, um, did I make the decision that I wanted to grab the mic and that I wanted to pursue a career. And um, the first time I ever got on stage was in a, a spot in Brooklyn. Um, and it was so unique that uh, the Daily News did a piece on it. Nice. Like, they weren't covering any other hip-hop, but yet this white rapper with no record ever, uh -huh. you know, got a little blurb in, in, the, in the Daily News or the New York Post or one or the other. Yeah. And um, that's the first time I performed. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, it was great. Yeah. It was great. And I knew, like, I had found my calling, but it was also because, you know, I had to battle my ass off. I had to be a battle MC. Um, because again, there was no business of hip hop. I had a feeling that there might be, yeah, I had an inkling that there could be a career in this, yeah, but there was no proof of that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It had just started to manifest itself when I graduated high school, mm -hmm. and then there were records coming out, and there were video shows coming out, and which meant you know people had music videos coming out and you know, so there was all that stuff, but you know, there was no, there was no proof that there was going to be anything of any, you know, longevity. And and I can honestly say that everything I have now, every every stitch of clothing, the phone that I'm on now, the car that I drive, the money in my bank, what have you, the 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 rock that I have on my son's you know nightstand, everything that I have is because of hip hop. I literally owe hip hop everything. Because I am sure that even though I might have had success in doing something else, it would pale in comparison to the success I've had as a member of this culture. You know, back in the day, people today probably don't even understand, especially certainly young people, it wasn't easy to just go record a song. You couldn't just go make music and record it and put it out you know it's just amazing how obvious that is to people our age but people today you know you make a song on your on your phone you put it up on youtube the second you know you uh, 10 minutes later after you start trying everyone your friends is listening to it but back in the day you had to go in a studio studio time was expensive the equipment the mics everything you had to kind of you had to kind of make sort of some noise just to even be able to get into a studio to even record a song in the first place do you remember how that happened and what it felt like to get into a studio and actually start recording well yeah i mean you know for me i was very fortunate that you know i had parents who were super supportive um you know my mom told me she said look keep a job that will keep you know gas in the car yep. and keep the insurance on your car keep a job and you know we'll we'll help you you know, create a demo and all of that. And, uh, you know, she, she was super supportive and, you know, towards the end, you know, became so, you know, laborious that I, I had three jobs. I was literally working three jobs. Yeah. Um, I was driving a USDA truck, uh, U S department of agriculture truck to free meal centers, which were basically daycare centers in the five boroughs. Uh -huh. Um, well, let me, let me read. No. So from, at four 30 in the morning, I would wake up, I would then pick up Yeshiva boys from Queens and bring them to Far Rockaway. Yeah. So I had a route. I had to pick up like six kids. Uh 
Uh-huh. So I, I picked them up. I take them to yesh- to Rabbi Chait's, uh his yeshiva in Far Rockaway. Then I would drive over to the Hartman Y and pick up my truck, load the truck, pick up the truck, deliver all day, get back at like 4.30. Then I would pick up the yeshiva boys who were done at 5, drop them off, and then get back at like 6.30. Thirty, and then I would, from seven to eleven o'clock at night, I would deliver pizza or chicken. Chicken, I do more chicken than pizza. Yeah. Or for a place <laughs> called Chicken Tender, yeah. and I would do, and I would do that. <laughs> and you know, then I would get a couple hours sleep. Um, and all that while you're thinking, I want to get in the studio and make music, but got to work, got to work, got to work. I mean, but that Just was, you know, but that's studio. what I had to do, uh-huh, uh-huh. you know. And then I valet parked at uh, Young Israel. I was a valet parker on the weekends. Yeah. So when I wasn't driving the USDA truck and I wasn't driving the Yeshiva boys, I had that job. But I did all of that so that I could get into the studio, you know, uh, one or once or twice a week. So you, you get in the studio... Your, your, what was the first uh, song you you recorded? Did it did it make the record or was it? It did. It, it was a song called Melissa. Oh, okay, nice. And it was also it was released on a label called Warlock Records. Wow. Um, and the other side of the record was called Hey Boy. I'm sorry, Contact. Sorry. Ugh. So it was Melissa and Contact, and it was terrible. It was a terrible fucking record. But I thought it was great. Uh, I rhymed with like a British accent because Ricky D was, you know, I went to school with him and him and Dana Dane rhymed in like British type Brooklyn accent. So I figured that was something I was allowed to do. Uh, not knowing the whole idea of being a biter and what that was. I was 17 years old. Uh, put that record out. And um, I remember me and my manager going to a DJ and slipping the guy some money to play the record. And the guy looked at me and said, yo, the only reason I'm playing this piece of shit is because you paid me. And I, <laughs> and I extended my hand and I said, thank you. <laughs> like I went to shake his hand and I said, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very polite you know? uh, young rapper. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was a very polite young rapper. I really, you know, the um, funny thing was when I, you know, kind of had a career, I, I you know, I bumped into this guy and like I wanted to tell the story, but I, I didn't realize that if I would have told the story, it was like, you know, payola pagola, and it would have cost the guy his job. So, right, right, like, right. Like I couldn't say that. Yeah, you know, I couldn't say the story out loud. But yeah. yeah. Um, so then you guys, yeah. you guys got signed by Def Jam, right? The biggest label in hip hop. Is that is that what happened? Did I have this right? Or so yeah. So I I, I put out two independent singles. Um, I put out, you know, the Melissa record in contact, but then I, I, then my wife sent my wife. Okay. Yeah. I got my wife on the brain. My mom and I started a label with my, my manager, Tony D called idlers records. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And we put out our, my next single, which was called Hey Boy. And the B side was called go white boy. Wow. Right? It was it used the uh, wild cherry, uh, sample, play that funky music, white boy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we all know who so did that. that. We all know who did that later as well. Correct. So um, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> yeah, but um, so we put out that independent record, and the very next single we put out was Jim Browski by the Jungle Brothers. Uh, so that record blew up and did really well. So you know the label was getting a lot of buzz. I was performing all through New York. Um, I had already been signed to. Rush Management, and um, connected with, you know, Pete through Sam Sever, uh, our producer, and, um, you yeah, know, two and a half years later, we signed to Def Jam. Yeah. So when you guys signed to Def Jam, that was, you know, rock, rock the hip-hop world a little bit, right? Like, people were kind of going, whoa, what's I remember going? that, yeah, well, you know what was crazy? We didn't want to let anybody know we were white. Oh, yeah. So we put out when we put out Step Into the AM, there were no publicity photos. Ah, yeah. There was no publicity in, at all. Actually, there was no pictures of us. We just wanted people to to play the record because you know, based on skills. Yeah, yeah. We didn't want people to understand, you know, who we were, or what we were. That's why the video. When you see the video Step Into the AM, you see you know me with a hood on, 
and I go, I'm going up to Ralph McDaniels, and then he pulls the hood off, and you see the third base, and I say, it's the other man, you know, because we wanted, you know, to fuck people up, like, oh, shit, they're white, get the fuck out of here, you yeah. know, so yeah, yeah. Um, we really wanted that, like, shock value, but in the best possible way, because, you know, we didn't want to be, you know, I think a lot of people forget that the BC Boys had a street record with Hold It Now Hit It. Uh-huh. You know, Hold It Now Hit It was the. I was so mad because in the club I went to, or the clubs I went to, that record was a big record. Like it was a big club record. You know, Hold It Now Hit It had a big bass, big, big line. Like, you know, people weren't thinking about the BC Boys as white MCs or white, you know, beer drinkers or, you know, it was none of that. Mm. It was just holding out. Hit it was. I'm a chill well, when I start to kill when I fill my pocket with a nine dollar bill. Like yeah. that rhyme right there was hard body in '86, '87. Yeah, yeah. Man. Having out the well, when I went out and when I get my fill, I'm chilly chill. Well, I just got home because I'm out on bail. What's the time? It's time to buy ale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's some, that was some real street shit. Yeah, yeah. Like they're talking about. They're not talking about. Budweiser's and fucking body slamming. They're, they're talking about getting out of jail and fucking got a not a not a fucking dollar bill to anybody. That was some street shit. Yeah, yeah. You know, did how, um, how much did you guys cross paths with the Beastie Boys? I mean, I don't know the real I mean, history of your a little bit. Not. I mean, I think the best story is the one that they put in their book. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I think that's you know that's the. That's the funny story. I mean, we we would see them on a regular basis because we were all New York kids. Yeah. But when they left Def Jam, it was ugly because they were suing Russell. Yeah. And they were suing New York, and they were suing Def Jam, and they were suing Columbia when they when they went to Capitol. Um, and we were having some real problems with Russell. Um, so I went to see Mike D because um, Russell lived on Bower Street, and Mike D lived on Bower Street. And uh, I knocked on on Mike's door, and I went upstairs to his apartment, and I was like, yo, you know, we're having these problems, you know, is there any light you can, you know, share with me? And he was telling me, yo, you got to be careful of this and this and this and this. And then he started throwing shit at me. Like, I was looking in the apartment, he started throwing, like, sponges and shit, like, laughing. So I'm like, oh, he's fucking around, whatever, whatever, right? And then, like, three months later or some shit, like, I'm reading Spin Magazine. Maybe it was six months later, something like that. And I'm reading Spin Magazine, and the the writer asked, hey, did you hear about, you know, these guys' third base? And Mike D in the magazine said, yeah, I know, sir. He came, you know, he came to see me. I threw shit at him. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, like, uh, you know, without telling the whole story. So it's like... I was like, yo, fuck you. You know what I mean? Like, yo, that's not even how it went down, you know? Right, right, right. So there was some real animosity, you know, that I had towards them. And I and that kind of carried over for a long time because I just didn't feel like they made, like, what I deemed. Because, you know, for me, I was the, the you know, I, I was the only word on authentic white rap. Like, you couldn't, you know, like, that was how I kind of position myself uh-huh. like I'm this authority and, and everybody else is fugazi if you don't you know pass my test so to speak right you always were, was, you've always you know, been pretty quick to I mean you you did never hesitate to to you know diss do a diss rap I mean the gas face of course was uh was the first thing that I I saw you for the first time in the gas face I love the humor in it and that was that was exciting up in Canada we got things a little late you know but uh, but back back in the 80s when I saw the gas face I thought this is amazing and you guys were dissing MC Hammer because Hammer had you know can't touch us this was the biggest song on the radio and you know he had the, the crazy parachute pants and everything and you guys were just kind of went in on him was that Pretty wild. Well, that was not the only reason. I mean, he he <laughs> tried to he tried to diss Run DMC. Ah. Like that was our main problem was that he dissed Run DMC. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Like, how do you diss Jam Master J and Run DMC? Like you're from Oakland, money. Like, come on, relax. And then so, then of course the 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 pop goes the weasel. Was the vanilla <laughs> was the was the throwing it back at Vanilla Ice? You know who also Correct. used to play that funky music white boy sample? Was that something that kind of Set that off. Hey, how how come you're using my sample? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. 
<laughs> he had way more success than I had with my sample. <laughs> um, no, I, I think the you know for us it was real simple. He was he was fake. Like he was not a legitimate artist. Like he was not. Our whole thing was when we did Pop Goes the Weasel was we wanted a platform where if our record went pop, we could tell all the pop radio stations about the records they should be playing. Yeah. So when we went on our tours of of pop stations, we would give them lists of records, lists of artists that they should be playing: De La Soul, Queen Latifah, Native Tongue, Steps of Sonic, Tribe Called Quest, Eric B and Rock Kim. Like we would just go on this list on and on and on and on and on. Like we didn't even care about being there for the interview. Maybe Pete did or whatever, but I was there. Like you do realize we're dissing you for playing this record, right? Yeah. Like you, I would literally talk to people on the air. Like, you know, we're dissing your whole station for playing this. Why don't you play this and this and then? That's the real pop music industry. You know, that that's what people are really listening to. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what I was, you know, referring to. Um, so that was our real beef with Vanilla Ice, because he was a fucking clown. Now, did you, you ever know, cross paths with not him? Authentic. You ever cross paths with him and and have to kind of talk that out, or or is that just kind of the song came out and you never really heard from him? No, I, the closest we ever, closest we ever came is I did have a smiley show on BET before he went to PBS, yeah. and I did have a smiley, and I was in New York. And Tavis was at the BT studios and they had me via, um, you know, via satellite, if you will. Yeah. And, um, so I'm on, it's somebody else. And it was Vanilla Ice. It was all like, we were all on a panel together, but I couldn't see him. And the, I guess he could see me. I don't know. But, um, you know, I just, that was as close as we ever came. I've never had words with the dude. Yeah. Like I've never had words with him. He's never contacted me on on social, vice versa. Like I, you know, I just I don't have uh, a relationship with the dude. Um, and then you know he came out with that whole thing with his dreads and hip hop's a culture, and you know like he just was a cornball and he, and he played himself. But you know again, you know. At the end of the day, like, as I look back, like, I'm very proud of my contributions to the culture, whether that's Third Base or myself or Nas or OC or Nonfiction or Echo Unlimited, you know, was it, or the, you know, although I wasn't like an executive producer, but, you know, the White Rapper Show and, you know, I'm just really proud of my contributions to the culture um, because I feel like they are at every level uh, authentic. What do you and think? I represented the culture to the best, I, to the best of my ability. So what do you think about the current state of hip hop? I mean, you know, it's a loaded question. Like, I, 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 first of all, I love hip hop. I love, I love Kendrick Lamar. I love Lil Uzi Vert. I love Triple Extension. May you rest in peace. I love Juice World. May you rest in peace. You know, I, I, I love, I love, I love good shit. I love Megan Thee Stallion. I, I just, I love all sorts of good shit. Period. I love J Cole. Like, you know, I love Joey Badass. There's a kid in Brooklyn named Lil D in Coney Island. I love that kid. You know, I still listen to new Jada music. Whenever Jada puts out new shit, I'll, I'll listen to it. Like, you know, I love hip-hop, so I'm very happy with the current state of affair of the culture because people are still able to eat and survive and thrive by, you know, by this culture that came out of the Bronx. When you when you uh, you run into any of those the rappers from way back the forefathers of hip hop that started this this genre and you you, you talk to any of the early 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 rappers that were doing this that never really kind of made any money off of it and just kind of are they do they look up and see wow this is we we created this you know we do you think that some of those early early groups and rappers should share in in the success of all this somehow. That's a 
great question. You know, I think that when you look at rappers like Melly Mel and, and Grandmaster Kaz, and then you look at rappers like Tila Rock and Special K, there's definitely a disparity, right? You know, there, there's definitely a disparity between, you know, the Treacherous Three and, uh, and you know, and and Kaz and Melly Mel, as much as there's a disparity between Eric B. and Rakim and Jay-Z, um, I do believe that there should be some something. I don't know what it is, but, you know, when you, you know, Jay-Z says he's overcharging motherfuckers for what they did to the cold crush. Okay, well, you know, that's a dope line, but it certainly lends to the idea of, do we do for our elders in hip hop what the rock guys have done for their elders in rock and roll? You know, what Eddie Vedder and, you know, the Foo Fighters have done for the early veterans of this culture the same way that, you know, the the Colt Fords, if you will, and, and the country artists have done for the Charlie Pride and the Wilson Pickett, you know? So, you know, is there a foundation of, of you know, Reparation, if you will, I hate, and I don't want to use that word because it's not that. But can we pay back those guys? I think what's going on with the uh, the hip hop, you know, Hall of Fame that's being built in the Bronx, I think is a, is a start. Yeah, I think with Jay and Nas and Diddy and Steve Stout committing all that money, I think that's a start. I think that you know, committing housing. Uh, for life for those artists on the top floor of that is a start, um, you know, so they don't ever have to worry about, you know, rent or utilities and all that stuff. Yeah, because it's, 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 it's a billion dollar industry and you're probably talking about a handful of people, right? Like how many how many people are we talking about that really invented hip hop that may, may be sitting there looking going like, hey, I invented that. It's, it, there's billions of dollars being earned by major corporations, and uh, you know they should be compensated for sure. Yeah, no, I, and I think you're right. I think if you if you think about it, you know, not to get too deep in the weeds, because I, you know, again, I don't know how many of your podcast listeners are like aficionados, but yeah, I mean, it's the same thing as you know, saying you know, you know, does Bob Marley deserve to get you know money from Bougie Bonton? You know, and is that happening? Well, the Marleys are smart. You know, the Marleys kind of built on his brand and built on his legacy. I don't know if Cool Herc's kids are doing the same thing. You know, I think it's incumbent upon ourselves to kind of make sure that, you know, we take care of ourselves always. But I also think that when you think of, like, DJs, there's a big difference between Grandmaster Flash and Grand Wizard Theodore. You know, Grand Wizard Theodore invented the scratch. Yeah. Grandmaster Flash, you know, manipulated the scratch into something big, but Theodore invented the scratch. You know, I don't know where, you know, Theodore sits with everything. Um, but you're right. I, I do think there's maybe a handful of people still alive that deserve to get a penny from every record that ever gets sold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, well, Search, it's, it's, it's great talking to you. I don't want to keep you all day. I know we could talk and talk and talk, but I, 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 maybe we can do it again sometime too, for sure. But uh, I mean, what? How are you? How are you holding up with the, with the whole uh, pandemic that's going on? And and I mean, are you are you safe? Are you hunkered down there? Do you got? Yeah, I mean, I know you're you're safe, but I mean, what? How are you? How are you dealing with all of this right now? Real quick before we wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I still don't know what you're talking about with this <laughs> pandemic shit, man. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, B. Like, I got, like, you know, I got a bag of weed. I am got I got my porn. My wife is here. No, nah, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. No, you know, it's like, you know, it's like with anything else, brother. You just, you know, you stay clean. You stay safe. It's a beautiful day today. I'm going to go for a walk with my wife and, you know, and just enjoy the sunshine. And, you know, I, I think, you know, the one thing I, I am very proud of is that me and my partner, Richard Black, Stone and started a company to get masks and get ventilators and gowns and hazmat suits to hospital, hospitals and states in need. Uh, it's based on a very simple philosophy of tikkun olam, which is a Jewish philosophy, which is, you know, it's, our, it's incumbent upon us to heal the world and do our, do our job. And with all of this craziness, with you know, the states not being able to get what they need and, and hospitals not being able to get what they need. Um, you know, me and my cousin took it upon ourselves to just be like, okay, what can we do? 
how can we figure this out? Like, you know, and, um, you know, we have literally millions of masks going to North Carolina, millions of masks going to the state of New York, New Jersey, um, you know, hospitals in five different states. So, you know, um, that's what I'm doing. I don't know what everybody else is doing, but that's what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, other than that, I'm keeping my hands clean. Well, I appreciate it. That sounds like a, a great contribution. Thank you, Search, for uh, for talking to me today. You have a great walk and in, enjoy uh, enjoy the weather and uh, stay safe out there in Florida. Okay. Yeah, and, and thank you, man. Thank you, Tom, for your contribution to my to my gut <laughs> and to my laugh. Um, and uh, I really appreciate everything you've done. And I, I'm I'm really glad I'm getting to know you, brother. All right. Likewise, absolutely, Search. I appreciate it. MC Search, E M C E E S E R C H on Instagram, correct? Right. Yes. And MC Search, M C S C R C H on Twitter. Yeah, absolutely. Search, peace, peace and love. Thank peace, you so much. Love, peace, and hair grease. Yeah. Peace and love. Another episode of the Tom Green Podcast. Thank you once again to the incredible, the legendary, MC Search of third base. They say never meet your heroes, but I right now can tell you that statement could not be further from the truth. I've had a great, great time getting to know uh, MC Search over the last uh, few weeks and months, and I'm looking forward to many more conversations with him in the future. If you'd like to support this podcast, subscribe to the Tom Green Podcast. If you're listening, just hit subscribe. You can subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, all over the place. Wherever you listen to podcasts, just hit subscribe. I'm doing it every day. Listen. I really, really appreciate all the support. You're bringing me so much energy and comfort during this ridiculous, scary, and unsettling time in our world. And with that, I will say, have a great day. Have a great night. I'll see you all tomorrow. And thanks for listening. Be safe.